I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science and engineering. My name is Taylor Sparks. I'm an associate professor and associate chair of material science and engineering at the University of Utah, and I'm joined as always by Andrew Falkowski. How are you doing, Andrew? Uh, I'm doing well. It's a rainy morning in Salt Lake, and uh, you know it's about time. We've been needing rain for so long, and we finally got a nice storm last night. It's always nice waking up to that crisp, cold, post-rain morning. Man, it goes from like blazing hot summer to chilly cold. We're in here drinking hot cocoa today, and it's normally like we're sweating buckets, but man, it's a new season. We're here for it. We are so excited for the podcast today. Uh, to kick it off, currently, the, the amount of power, at least in the United States, that we get from renewables and sort of non-fossil fuels is very small. I don't remember the exact number. I think it's less than 20%, though. And it's probably going to be that way for some period of time, which means that we're going to be taking fossil fuels, petroleum, gas, coal, right, and converting those to electricity. Now, Andrew, there is no way that is more efficient to do that than actually burning these in what are called gas turbine engines. And you've seen these before. If you've flown an airplane and you looked out the window, underneath that airplane wing, that giant engine is also a gas turbine engine. These things are incredibly efficient. They top 60% efficiency, which is mind-boggling. Now, how do they do it? In your introductory physics class, or if you've taken thermodynamics already, hopefully as students, you've learned that efficiency scales, the Carnot efficiency scales with the difference in the temperature, right? The hot and the cold temperatures. So we can't do much about the cold temperature. We still have to fly these planes to Russia and to Hawaii, right? But what we can do is operate them at higher and higher temperatures inside the engines. In fact, these things operate at a temperature that would cause the metal that these engine components are made of to actually melt. Now, how on earth do we actually do that and not have them melt? It's a tiny, thin piece of ceramic and a system that goes along with it. And that's the topic of today's episode. They're called thermal barrier coatings. Yeah, it's amazing to think that something as thin as your fingernail could protect uh, these massive turbine blades uh, from melting down and basically destroying your entire system. It's pretty incredible. There's been three big advances in the area of cooling um, the metals right inside of a turbine engine. One is they introduce, and we're going to do this in a future episode for sure, is these tiny intricate channels that actually go through it. So you can actually pass coolant right through the blade itself. That's amazing. The second thing they've done is they've engineered the alloys themselves to withstand far higher temperatures. There's been this whole progression of, you know, changing the alloy and understanding how to make sure that it's creep resistant and oxidation resistant. That has the, all the strength and necessary properties. And then the third one is the effect of the thermal barrier coating, right? You said it's about as thin as your fingernail. And yet across that small physical distance, you can drop several hundred degrees Celsius, which allows you again to operate where normally this metal would be melting. Pretty incredible stuff. Yeah, I mean, they're called super alloys for a reason. Right? They're very impressive. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what a thermal barrier coating is. What's it consist of? You know, how do they come to be a little bit? All right, now the metal that we're protecting is a nickel super alloy. And don't worry, we definitely have a future episode on these and probably on the casting process to make them coming up in the future. That said, it's a metal. It conducts heat really well. What we need for the barrier coating, obviously, is a material that does not conduct heat very well. In fact, if you've taken an introductory you know, material science course or a heat transfer course, you've seen that the thermal conductivity, assuming you know solid state heat diffusion, right? So it's under steady state conditions. You have the difference in temperature from the hot side to the cold side. The, the lower the thermal conductivity of your material, the bigger that difference is going to be than with a linear profile, assuming that you have a homogeneous material between it. Sure, yeah. I mean, you're going to be slowing the rate that heat's going to be accessing that protected material in this case. Yeah. So what sort of materials come to mind when we think of low thermal conductivity? Well, if you listen to our episode on thermoelectrics way back two years ago, we talked quite a bit about this. Um, there's a number of things we can do to sort of reduce thermal conductivity. We're going to probably circle back to those in a minute in this conversation. But for now, just realize that the material of choice right now is yttrium stabilized zirconia which I know we've talked about a few times on this episode because it's an amazing ceramic. It's the same one that is used, they call it ceramic steel, right? Because it has the transformation toughening mechanism. What's really cool about this application is that they don't use it for its toughening mechanism. In fact, they specifically try and avoid the toughening mechanism in this case. They do need it for its low, uh, low thermal conductivity, 
but there's other factors to play. So what else is important here? So if you're going to have a ceramic protecting a metal, it's not as simple as just slopping some ceramic onto the surface. Let's consider all the different properties that we have to have. For one thing, obviously, it can't melt at the temperatures we're going to be operating. So it has to be a high melting point material, right? Um, what else? It has to be low thermal conductivity. That's how we're getting the difference in temperature that's protecting the metal. What else? I mean, we don't want it to deform under these conditions either. We want it to be relatively rigid. Yeah, and yet at the same time, we have to worry about thermal expansion. I, this is always a point that kills so many materials. Whenever you put two different materials together and they're bonded together like a coating, right, and they expand at different rates, think about this. This turbine has to be frozen, you know, basically on the Arctic tundra, and then it has to get up to temperature very quickly. This difference in temperature, you've got your metal alloy that's expanding at probably on the order of, you know, 10 times the ceramic typically, if not more. And so if it's expanding then you need that coating. You want it to be strong, but it also has to be compliant, right? It has to accommodate that strain mismatch from the thermal expansion difference. That's a challenging thing. Um, and then lastly, you need your material to be stable both in the environment where it's being you know, operated, which could include steam. It could, it could include sand particles. It can include lots of problematic things, but also on the substrate. It can't react with the metal too much in a, in a negative way either. So it's a tall order. There's a lot going on here that we have to satisfy. Yeah, exactly. I think, you know, as material scientists, you often want to find that great, like, unicorn material that does it all. <laughs> but you'll often end up with a suboptimal, you know, material where it does okay at both things. But in this case, right, we really want to use the properties, the amazing creep resistance properties of the nickel super alloy and the amazing thermal properties of these ceramic coatings. Um, and we're just going to have to overcome these challenges of putting two and two together. Yeah. I remember when I was a grad student, that was, I was, I was really naive because what all, the only thing I was working on was low thermal conductivity oxides. All we wanted to find were these super complex, interesting structures that had crazy low thermal conductivity. And I remember thinking at the time, like, gosh, there's, we found lots of materials that are lower than YSC, you know, a factor of two in some cases, like pretty significant reduction. But when you consider all the other factors, right, the thermodynamic stability, how it interacts with sound particles, you know, will it form, how will it react with the, the underlying metal and all that, it gets complicated. So let's zoom out maybe a minute and talk about what this microstructure looks like. If you took one of these turbine blades and you, you know, cross-section this thing in half, this might be a good thing for you to do at home, is Google the, what a TBC actually looks like. You'll see that it's not just one thing. It's not a ceramic that's just sort of magically sticking to your metal. There's a lot going on. Andrew, what's happening in there in the picture that you see? All right, so if we start at the tip of the super alloy, we move up into what's called the bond coat. Now, this is going to be an alloy that attempts to do a number of things. The first is it aims to kind of mediate the thermal expansion issues between the ceramic and the metal. Right. By kind of bridging this gap, um, it hopes to reduce the amount of stresses that both of them are going to experience when the mismatch occurs. Yep. The other thing that it does is... This alloy is composed of a number of different constituents, and when they are brought up to temperature, these constituents will evolve and in some cases decompose, but this is intentional. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's exactly like stainless steel, right? You intentionally add chromium metal. You don't add chromium oxide to stainless steel. You add chromium metal knowing that it will react to form the chromium oxide on the surface. You're yeah, essentially exactly. getting the same thing. You're adding aluminum-rich bond coat materials, knowing that, that when it gets heated in air at high temperatures, it's going to form what we call the TGO, the thermally grown oxide. This thermally grown oxide is really important. It does a couple things. First off, it provides a barrier against future oxidation, right? We know this. It's a passivating layer. This is like why aluminum is used in so many things. It makes a really good barrier because oxygen ions don't travel through it with beans, right? They have really slow diffusion. But it also serves another purpose. It helps bond now the TBC, the thermal barrier coating itself, to that bond coat layer. Yeah, it's kind of like a diffusion bond, right? Right. So, and then obviously when you heat this thing up and you, you now are going to use it, obviously if you had this bond coat layer which had different elements, we know that this is eventually a, a diffusion couple you've made. And then obviously there's a reaction between the bond coat materials and the nickel alloy. And so you can see that, you know, beneath the bond coat. So... We've got the makings of something that a ceramic could adhere to. We have this thermally grown oxide. Now we need to figure out a way to actually put a low thermal conductivity ceramic to that. Um, how do we do it? There's two ways that they use in industry. You either do electron beam, physical vapor dep deposition, where literally imagine like a microscope, like an SEM microscope where you have a beam of electrons, except that now instead of hitting a target that you're visualizing, 
you increase the voltage, there's a lot more going on. It hits a substrate, which you're trying to volatilize, and so it can eject a plume onto a material. So it's simple as that. It works great if you have a really small component. It's expensive. It's really hard to scale this into large areas. But for small things like, you know, blades inside of a, a turbine, yeah, you can do this and get really high-quality films. And then the other way is plasma spray. Do you want to describe plasma spray for us, Andrew? To my understanding of plasma spray, essentially you're superheating some sort of material to a molten state, and then you're sp essentially just spraying it with, like, a high-powered pressure. I mean, it's a little more complicated than that, but you're essentially just creating a molten material and spraying it almost in a hose-like fashion onto your material. Yeah, it says here about the plasma spraying process. It's a, it says you take the coating process in which the powders of the coating materials themselves get fed into a plasma jet that's at, you know, obscene temperatures, 10,000 Kelvin, and then get sprayed onto some sort of surface. The benefit here is the rate at which you can put it down. You can put down big, thick coatings. You can cover large areas, um, but it's not as high of a quality film. In fact, if you look at the microstructure of these two things, they look totally different. Yeah, imagine like just dripping paint onto something, uh -huh. right? When it hardened, you're just going to get these flattened drops and kind of a lamellar structure is what they call it. Yeah, that's what they see. The, uh, the sort of plates are parallel to the surface of the metal, Whereas you get a completely different structure with EBPVD, right? The electron beam structures. The first time I saw them, I remember th thinking that I was looking at a feather or something like a wing. Because these things, they're, they're vertical, they're columnar, and the columns aren't like solid shafts. They're these sort of feather-looking structures that have filled with porosity, obviously, inside of them, and also between the ridges between columns. Now, there's some big benefits to this approach, EBPVD. The biggest benefit is that it is tolerant to lateral strain, which is exactly what we need because the metal underneath it is going to expand at a different rate than the ceramic. And since you have a bunch of these columns which are technically separated one from another, you've sort of built in a material that has a ton of cracks, you know, right through it. And so it is compliant in the lateral directions. That's a big deal. Yeah, the other advantage comes in terms of thermal conductivity or heat transport. And when you think about thermal conductivity, we can think about this in terms of intrinsic and extrinsic properties. The material on its own has some you know, correlated heat transport. This is associated with its structure and how electrons and phonons can move through it. And this is something that's just intrinsic to the material itself. When we want to achieve exceptionally low thermal conductivity values, we need to introduce some extrinsic properties as well. And that's where the electron beam physical vapor deposition method comes into play, right? We get these nice column structures that are separated by spaces. So you have a lot of convective heating that can occur in that area. At the same time, the material gets laid down with porosity. These are areas where heat is going to have to transport by the convective method, and thus you're going to be able to slow it down. Yeah. So you get this, not only yttri stabilized zirconia, which has pretty great thermal conductivity, or at least a pretty low thermal conductivity value for a ceramic. Oh yeah, it's not And bad. now it has a very porous structure. And, and combined with this um, columnar, you know, macro structure, you get a really fantastic material for reducing heat transport. Yeah, pretty phenomenal. Um, practically speaking, when they actually design these things, one thing that's nice is that, especially if you're doing uh, plasma spray, if you have a region of your device that needs more thermal shielding, you can just build up a bigger, thicker layer on it. And so it is a tunable way that allows you to sort of as, uh, as an engineer, if you need to design certain spots to have more protection, it's pretty easy to make that happen. Um, now, if you compare that to plasma spraying also, though, remember that they both have to have lateral strain compliance. And really the only tool that you have in plasma spray coating to provide that lateral strain compliance is incorporation of porosity, right? The more porosity you give it, if you've taken a ceramics class, you probably learned about it. The more porous a ceramic it is, it does tend to be more compliant, right? You reduce the Young's modulus. And so that's about what you have. Now, that's beneficial because it's going to reduce the thermal conductivity, but it also, we know this also degrades strength. Both of these materials, these microstructures that get generated, have porosity, and that's going to reduce their strength. It's also going to make them more likely to interact with what's called C-mass. What is C-mass, right? C-mass stands for calcium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon. It's basically dust. Dust, sand, you know, particles in the air. These things get ingested into the engine. In fact, these engines get tested under extremely rigorous conditions. They have to be able to hit like a bird, right, and suck yeah, it in. I think and they take a not, frozen goose or something it, and man. throw it in there. I remember in the early days, I was an undergraduate, went to some dinner for a scholarship banquet or something, and the guy was talking about this, like, oh, yeah, we launched it in the windshield, we launched it into the engine. And I was just like, what is he talking about? But yeah, they do. And so if, if it's going to survive that, it's also got to be able to survive some sand, right? So a little bit of sand gets sucked in there, and you might be like, well, what's the big deal with sand? If it can survive a frozen bird, sand's no big deal. Well, it gets tricky because those elements that are present in CMAS, C-M-A-S, so again, calcium, magnesium, aluminum, silicon, when they 
get sucked in, they typically have lower melting points. So they form a liquid and that liquid can easily wet the surface of these TBCs. And these TBCs, remember, especially if it's like an EBPVD with these columns, it can wet into those channels. That's going to cause all sorts of problems because it's going to mess with the thermal conductivity, obviously, right? Because you're getting rid of those pores on those channels. It's going to mess with the compliance once that thing cools down because now it's going to turn from a liquid to a solid and you're going to have things sticking and breaking. Um, it just causes a lot of problems to say nothing of whether it interacts with the components that are also present in the fuel. Sometimes fuel has problems, like it has sulfur or vanadium, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when those bond with zirconia, uh, they'll tend to form like lower melting point compounds. So you're essentially corroding away your thermal barrier. Yeah, absolutely. And so one of the things that they could do and they monitor the damage on these TBCs is they can actually see that over the course of its lifetime, the, f- the film thickness of these TBCs is actually slowly going down. But what's great about that is that it is predictable. Yeah. Right. By collecting data, we can know when these are going to wear down and thus you can take mitigating steps or steps to repair them as well. There is exceptional amount of, well, there's a lot of work that has been done to try to model the corrosion and failure of these turbines to understand exactly when they're going to fail and how long you can run them and when you can expect to have to replace them. Yeah. It's still, it's still a challenging area though. Even though they have a pretty good feel for the average failure rate, there is still a wide distribution of failure times. And so there's still some that just fail unexpectedly. It would be great to be able to monitor them. Obviously, there's some huge costs. You know, there's some numbers thrown out yeah, in I some of these resources I saw. It's like a million dollars a day when these, you know, big power generation turbines sure, go down. you have down. to turn that off. You're not generating any power. But even the blades themselves, like, these are oh, yeah. sophisticated <laughs> materials. Each blade is about a $10,000 a piece. Pretty wild. I, went, I remember when I started my PhD program, I thought for a minute that I was going to work on something called piezo spectroscopy. And they talk a little bit about one of the articles that I reviewed, you know, getting ready for this t- article today. Um, it's something my PhD advisor, Dr. David Clark, he's now at Harvard University, is famous for. And the whole concept is this. Um, what if you could probe a material without actually like ripping it off? You need some sort of non-destructive t- testing, but you need to do that at high temperatures and when it's spinning at you know, whatever, 20,000 RPMs or something like, how on earth do you do that? You're not getting away with ultrasound or anything else. So the idea behind it was this. Well, YSZ, the bond, the, you know, the TBC itself is a wide band gap semiconductor, meaning it should allow some type of light to go right through it. If you had a laser in the blue or the green, it should be able to go right through it down to say the bond coat, right? Or not just above the bond coat, actually probably the TGO, the thermally grown oxide layer. And in there, maybe it could interact in some way and through the process called photoluminescence, right, where those photons get absorbed, they go to a, height of, an, a higher state of energy, and then they relax and they give light off. Now that red light is going to come out. It's going to be able to escape the TBC. Even those things spinning at crazy speeds, you're going to be able to collect information out from sort of under the skin of this bond coat all the way down to the TGO layer. Well, under the skin of the thermal barrier coating down to the TGO layer and get information about whether it's intact, whether there's stress there, Pretty amazing things. So what would stress or a defect look like? Would it just be a change in the concentration of the light received in the wavelength? No, it's it's the wavelength, right? So there's a, and this is not my area of expertise. We'd have to talk to my old friend, Matt Chambers from my PhD program. He did a lot of this, but it's a shift in the Raman spectra, right? In their oh, wavelength, yeah. right? It's proportional. It's somehow proportional to the strain that's present in the lattice. So this was a really cool way to basically say, hey, there's evolving a large strain. Um, in fact, Understanding and predicting the strain at these interfaces is a pretty big deal. Um, if you look at it, there's been a lot of work. In fact, there forms a, a really cool microstructure. When you cycle these things over time and they've you know looked at them to figure out maybe it failed, when they actually harvested it and looked at it, they saw something really surprising. You've got the ceramic coat coating up top, the TBC layer, and then we expected to see a nice flat sort of thermally grown oxide right under that, and then a nice flat bond coat layer and a nice flat metal underneath that. But instead what they found is this undulating sort of rippling structure under there, which is pretty unique and pretty, it was in the early days hard to understand. So what was going on there, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, think about it, right? You have things heating up and cooling down. Over time, you're going to be putting a lot of strain on the materials, which translates to stress as well. And when materials undergo stress, they tend to want to eventually relax that stress. They want to remove it because it's an it's a high energy state it's not favorable and so one way to relax that is to change your dimensions and so essentially what they had happening was these stresses on these um these interfacial layers would cause buckling to occur uh and so you get this nice ribbon almost like a sine wave that would form between the alloy and your ceramic coating 
Yeah, it's pretty cool. In one case, they they trying to understand like, well, what's the cause of this? Why is this stress uh, related to the, the thermal cycling? Well, imagine you again in the bond coat, you had a bunch of aluminum. They added it intentionally because it would then grow to form a thermally grown oxide. Well, over time, that aluminum keeps on migrating to the thermally grown oxide layer. That thing grows. It grows slowly, but it grows. So you're losing aluminum from the bond coat. And as it leaves, that's putting right it under compression, right? And it's putting the bond coat under tension. So you've got a mismatch right there. That's causing some of the strain. The bond coat wants to get longer, right? It's trying to expand. And then another way to do it, or another way to think about what's causing the stress is actually inside the material itself. As you're going from, in this case, let's say your bond coat was made of, a pretty common one is nickel platinum aluminum. And in that case, as you're losing the aluminum, it's switching from one crystal structure to another. You're switching from something in the nickel aluminum crystal structure, so it's a one-to-one mixture basically, all the way over to nickel three aluminum, something where it's lost a bunch of aluminum, obviously, because you're losing the aluminum. And there's a volume change, right? It's shrinking. So there's multiple reasons that explain for this evolution of strain that's causing this undulation to sort of match that that strain that's happening in there. Pretty cool, though. This ends up being a really tricky balance because, you know, post-processing ceramics ends up being a big field, right? You want to adjust their properties. But once you bond it onto something, your post-processing is now going to affect the thing that it's bonded on. And these super alloys are intentionally designed with a very specific grain structure. You start trying to anneal your ceramics yeah. or doing this thing, you're going to be affecting your turbine blade. Yeah. So perfection in the actual coating is important. Well, I remember when TBC started being used in the, what, 90s or something, there had already been 50 years of work on the alloy system that they were being put on, right? So it was highly optimized. You're not going to go back and change that if you don't have to. You're going to try and make the ceramic accommodate to that alloy that's underneath it instead. I mean, that might even bring about necessarily suboptimal conditions like it might be that you want to actually design your alloy that it's being coated around the barrier so earlier you mentioned that they're not taking advantage of the transformation toughening properties of yttria stabilized zirconia can you talk a little bit about that why aren't they yeah i mean most of the times when you use ysz you have this huge benefit of the fact that when a crack sort of shows up in the material we know that the mechanism by which it toughens it is that there's a transformation. The tetragonal phase is not supposed to be in the tetragonal phase at room temperature. It's only there because it's metastable. And when you give it a crack nearby, since the tetragonal to monoclinic transformation, monoclinic being the stable phase, when that happens, it actually expands volume a little bit. Oh, so it puts that crack in compression then. Bingo. It puts sort of a closing stress on the crack. And so for applications where you're trying to prevent cracks from growing, that's really awesome. But for one thing, remember here, this is already full of cracks. These things have a uh, pretty defective structure but more importantly if there's this constant volume change because remember these things get cycled all the time they're going high temperature high low high low high low high low you would be constantly switching uh the volume of these individual components and that would cause cracking uh that would it would eventually just break right off right so they actually have to avoid that which is sort of ironic that they're actually trying to avoid what normally is the biggest selling point for ysc here so there's been a lot of work where they want to they want to add enough dopants that you get a large number of oxygen vacancies. Because remember, for every yttrium 3 plus that you put on a zirconium 4 plus site, you create an electron neutrality you know, problem. And the only way that you resolve that is by having half of an oxygen vacancy for every one of those. So in other words, for every two yttriums you put on there, you create one oxygen vacancy. Those oxygen vacancies are great at scattering heat basically the phonons that would carry heat through your material get scattered by this and so on one hand you're like well shoot we'd love to add as many defects as possible and there's a problem here if you look at the phase diagram for this you run into a problem if you add too many vac uh if you add too much yttria in the zirconia structure you actually will push it over to a regime where it's no longer in the tetragonal phase right and if you don't add enough then it will it will transform so there's this sweet spot where they call it the T prime or it's it's the non what do they call it they call it um T prime is the non transformable tetragonal phase meaning it's tetragonal but it's not going to transform to monoclinic right so you're not getting the benefit of the toughening um but it's also not going to be cracking as you cycle this thing over time so in this regime where they're working you really can't go above about 1500 celsius right even though the full tetragonal regime doesn't you know switch to cubic until almost 2000 Practically speaking, if you want to have this T prime phase, which is non-transformable, you can't go above 1500. So this puts an upper limit on your operation. If you could get away with using less yttria, you would have you know, higher thermal conductivity, which is not a good thing, but it would be able to operate at higher temperatures. But 
it would transform to monoclinic. So there's this whole, like, if this was all alphabet soup for you, let me just sum it up. Thermodynamics actually puts you in a, in a tricky spot here. If you don't have enough dopant, then it will crack due to the cycling back and forth because the phases are going to switch from one to the other. If you have too much, then it limits your high temperature operation for the same exact reason. You won't have the right phase that's non-transformable. Yeah, and there's a lot of work trying to look at other dopants they might be able to add to try to circumvent some of these problems, as well as the problem of chemical stability of the zirconia with some of the species that end up entering the turbine blades. So lots of rare earth metals like uh, thulium, erbium, Gadolinium, gadolinium zirconium oxide, GZO, yeah, yeah. that's a pyrochlor structure. That's one that my nomine visor worked a lot on. And I think that probably in the future, there's a good chance that we could find another ceramic system that does give us a little, you know, gives us another 25, 50 degrees or something. But it is getting to be pretty hard. We're sort of running out of tricks that we can play in the system. Now, that said, there are some really cool things that, that I, I saw discussed in one of the articles we were reading for this. One thing they talked about is they said, fine, you know, you've got your convection heat transport and you've got your conduction, right? But at really high temperatures, you actually get a bunch of heat radiatively moving right through your material, right? Remember we said that this is a wide band gap semiconductor. It's basically transparent to infrared light. So if you have a ton of energy coming in as radiation, it's going to pass right through your thermal barrier coating and go right to the metal and start melting it, right? So they've thought about ways to prevent that. So one thing you could imagine is, well, what if you put like a metal layer, a reflective layer right on the top of your thermal barrier coating, right? And uh, obviously that won't work because that's not going to withstand the conditions inside the engine, the gas, the particles. It, it, it would just get torn up, right? To say nothing of its uh, oxidation resistance. Sure, but there's got to be other ceramic materials that have uh, narrower band gaps that could be used for... Yeah, so that that's one potential idea. Another thing they've said, well, what if we put um, nickel oxide present in like the YSZ layer? And this can absorb, if you put them in the pores at a small amount of the secondary phase, it could absorb in the infrared and then it could emit in sort of like a longer wavelength or it could locally heat the material around it, right? So then you're back to conduction. So that's a pretty clever idea. And the coolest one I saw had to do with this idea. It came from the sort of laser community and the laser community there is this, when they have lasers, when they make lasers, you have to basically get the things all in sequence and the way that in phase, right? And the way that they do that is they have these vertical cavities where they reflect back and forth until they're all sort of in sequence one another another. So they call these vertical cavity semiconductor lasers. And the idea is that if you have two different materials with diff and you control the thickness between those, you can get reflectance as well there. So people have actually proposed maybe we could do that in our thermal barrier coatings. You could have YSZ and alumina alternating layers. And if you can control the thickness carefully, you could actually get reflectance to block some of this radiation, which would buy you even more, you know, higher temperature operation. The problem, though, is that for this to work, they have to be very flat. Like the roughness needs to be less than five nanometers in one paper I saw. And they don't achieve that with EBPVD or plasma spray. So I don't know if this is like not feasible or if it's just not something that somebody's tried or taken seriously as a possible yet. But it, it would technically be one way to prevent radiative heat transfer and therefore operate at slightly higher temperatures. Another problem, even if you could make this manufacture in the first place, remember, this is now operating at crazy high temperatures. You'd have to prevent spheroidization, right? Whenever you have like, think of like the lamella crystal structure when you have the eutectic transfer, uh, eutectic transformation. You have two phases that look like zebra coatings. You're like, oh, sweet, it's just what we want. But you let that thing sit at time and temperature and it spheroidizes, right? It gets rid of all that surface area. You'd have to prevent that from happening here. So tricky to do. Yeah, you'd have to do some sort of like pinning mechanism in there. And then one other thing I saw is that they could actually add dopants. So not secondary phases, but dopants. So if you add some rare earth or something that could absorb in the infrared and emit it longer, that could technically help a little bit. But it's just a hard problem. This is a tricky problem to solve because there's so many things to consider. Yeah, virtually any time you're working with ceramics or combination of different materials, you're going to run into this thermal expansion coefficient issue. Like it's just always going to be there. It's a rare instance when you find something that really just nicely matches up. But yeah. fortunately, we have these tricks. And what's kind of interesting as well is this is one of those scenarios where these turbine blades were under development for a pretty long time prior to the invention or the decision to move forward with putting these thermal barrier coatings on it. And so when it came time to actually do that, it wasn't a situation where we could say, oh, we're going to try to optimize the combination of the two. Like the turbine blades have oh, already been yeah, optimized. Yeah. Yep. So now it's kind of forcing the hand of the thermal barrier coater to match what has already been decided, which kind of runs into a problem. Like maybe it's possible that a better solution out there exists, 
but the development time of trying to re-optimize a two-part system, or I guess three-part because you have the bond coat, is going to be much harder, much more expensive, not something that industry would want to take up. So actually, I, I love that you brought that up. Actually, just last year, we actually were the recipients of funding from the Department of Energy through the program called ARPA-E Ultimate. Ultimate stands for Ultra High Temperature Impervious Materials Advancing Turbine Efficiency, right? And this was something, I, don't, I think there was like a dozen or so of these awards that went around the country. But the whole point of this, let me just read part of the description. It says, the Ultimate program targets gas turbine applications in the power generation and aviation, aviation industries. Ultimate aims to develop high temperature temperature materials for gas turbines, enabling them to operate continuously at 1300 degrees Celsius, which is crazy, in a standalone material test environment or with coatings, enable gas turbine inlet temperatures of 1800 Celsius, right? So it has, (laughs) this is insanely high temperatures, right? So the whole point of this program is like, hey, we have to do something other than nickel super alloys, or we have to radically rethink the way that thermal barrier coating is going to work if we're going to achieve these. So our approach uh, is actually, actually we're, we're scrapping the super nickel, super alloy made of nickel. We're moving towards materials that are fundamentally more refractory. The materials we're working on in our group is niobium, right? So now you have the challenge of saying, well, shoot, you had 50 years to get nickel alloys to be so creep resistant, figuring out the whole, you know, advances that went there. We're going to have to take that same approach and try and start moving it on another material system. But ideally we could start thinking about thermal barrier coatings and other things like that at the same time. So you could optimize them in, in sequence, right? Or in unison one with another. Yeah. You're standing on the shoulders of giants here. There's already been quite a lot of work. So you know, kind of where you want to go, but, um, my, my understanding of the refractory materials is that they, they open up some new challenges, especially when it comes to chemical compatibility. Absolutely. It's definitely, if it was easy, it would have been done before, but it's a fun time to be in this space because I mean, we already have incredibly efficient uh, gas turbine engines. Imagine if we could bump them up another, you know, 100, 200 degrees or whatever, what this will be possible. Yeah, I mean, these sorts of systems, even like single or couple degree increases, uh, nets you quite a lot of efficiency gain yeah. comparatively. Well, when you consider these are responsible for 35% of the total electrical power in the United States already, you know, very small changes lead to huge impacts on, on our overall efficiency. And I think this is also a good example of this maybe emerging trend in general where we've gotten so good and we have the software and the technical capabilities to design near perfect systems or hyper advanced systems. But we're running into this challenge of the materials even being able to withstand yeah. the systems that are the being designed, right? Like, sure, you can go in and you can find this very efficient turbine system, but unless you can actually manufacture material that can withstand the environment, it's not going to happen. And so they're really needs to be a push to developing these new alloys that just haven't haven't been used haven't been implemented in order to accelerate or even sustain the growth and the the development of these technologies absolutely well we hope you enjoyed this uh podcast today we are big fans of thermal barrier coatings we're obviously going to put a link to some of our favorite articles the one for my phd advisor i'm definitely partial to never mind that it's 20 years old it is really good The, the way that they describe things is really terrific it's better than your average review article yeah, it's one of those situations where some review articles just go through and list all of the you this know relevant this, papers. This person did this. But you never really come away learning that much. It's when an expert really goes in and provides that nuance that really binds everything together and kind of explains it that you get like a really solid paper. And I think that's what that yep. paper provides. Obviously, we are super grateful for our sponsors, the people that make the show possible. You know, we couldn't do it without you. So Matt Match, if you're, you know, if ever if you're ever looking for a material, first thing you should do pull up matmatch.com and just try and find it there first because I promise you won't be disappointed if they've got it. They have a great GUI. It's a great place to find things. It has tons of information. It's way better than Alpha Azar. It's way better than Sigma Aldrich. And we've tried all of these things and I have been really pleased with it. So check them out. We are also sponsored by Materials Today. And actually, in addition to the article that I read for this, there's another one by my PhD advisor, Dr. David Clark, and uh, Simon Philpot of University of Florida, where they've done another review-featured article on thermal barrier coatings. We're going to make that available as well. Really good one. It focuses much more on the materials rather than like the overall challenge. It's focusing just on the materials. That article uh, specifically focuses on the thermal transport on different class of materials. For example, in this episode today, we talked about YSC and we said a few words about GZO, but there's other materials out there. There's fluorites, there's pyrochlorous, there's quite a bit out there that you could consider. And in that article, they sort of do a deep dive into what those would look like if they were to be applied to thermal barrier coatings. So we'll put that in the show notes for you as well.
special thanks to materials today for making things like that available to our listeners. I think that's a really cool thing that they do. And obviously it's a great journal. They're a great, you know, publishing house. They do some really great things. As always, thanks for listening to the show. We really appreciate getting feedback. So if you like the show or you hate the show and want to give us some recommendations for how we can improve, send us an email at materialism.podcast at gmail.com or send us a message on Instagram at materialism.podcast. It's pretty lonely here in the shed, so we always appreciate when people send us some DMs or some nice emails. Um, We'd also want to thank Alphabot and Colabite who make the music for the show. It's really great to be able to include them. makes it a better experience for you and for us. And that about wraps it up. So, hope you enjoyed the episode. Catch you next time. See y'all. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton. The makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. <laughs>